Uh, good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Uh, welcome back as we will be continuing with the lectures for today. Before we do that, can we open with a word of prayer? Amen. Um, one of the things that we have been learning uh, throughout this camp, it's the third angel's message. And the emphasis, if you can recall from the presenters, was on the binding off. And when you look at the theme for this camp, it's that the night cometh. Now, one of the things what Brother Patrick was touching on as he was giving us the binding of structure, we realized also that the binding of it's the effect of every vision, right? And as it is the effect of every vision, it's full of symbols. So one of the things that I'll be you know, presenting for this coming two presentations, I'll be dealing with the number eight, number 12, and the number 21. And one of the things that you will be seeing there, it's that those numbers, they symbolize events that will be taking place at midnight. Because since we know that midnight is the effect of every vision, so now we know that everything fits here. But I will be you know, sharing them in a way that we can understand why we mark the number eight here. Already Brother Patrick was showing us about the number 12, you know, the number... The, the number 38, the one, two, threes, you know, everything was fitting here, but he was able to lead us to the point of getting to this point. You know, I just want to write this. I have forgotten to, read, to write. So you will, one of the things that we saw is that the binding of indeed, it's just full of symbols. And we need to understand these symbols correctly because each and every symbol is teaching us events that are gonna be taking place at midnight. So I want us to first look at the number eight. And in your notes, I think it's page 177. In your notes, it's page 177. And then the first verse that I'll be using to show why the number eight is placed here. It's found in Second Chronicles, chapter 29. Second Chronicles, chapter 29. Second Chronicles, chapter 29, verse 14. Actually, from verse 15 to verse 17. It reads as follows. And they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves and came according to the commandment of the king by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. Verse 16. And the priest went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it and brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord and the Levites took it to carry it out abroad into the brook Kidron. Now they began on the first day of the first month to sanctify, and on the eighth day of the month, they came to the porch of the Lord. So they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days, and in the sixteenth day of the first month, they made an end. So we are seeing here that they are priests and Levites who are cleansing what? What are they cleansing? And what is the temple? It's our bodies, right? So how many groups of people are cleansing this temple? It's the priests and what? And the Levites, right? So who begins first 
to do the work of cleansing? It's the priest, correct? So one of the things that we know is that this time period or this line, it's the line of what? So when did they begin to cleanse the temple? On which day? Now, according to the verse, which day is it? The first day of the first month, right? So where do we mark the first day of the first month in our line? Where, where do we mark it? The first day of the first month. Brother Mark was teaching us, right? It's 2014, right? So this is the first day of the first month. This is when they began to cleanse the house of the Lord, right? And they cleansed the house of the Lord for how many days? It says eight days, correct? And on the eighth day, they arrived where? Where did they arrive on the eighth day? It's at the porch, correct? According to the verse, it said on the porch. So I'll be, I will write the porch here and I will show you why we are writing the porch here. So one of the things that you, I want us to see is that as they are cleansing the house of the Lord for eight days, on the eighth day, they arrive at the porch. Are you following? So I have a quotation that I want us to read to understand this cleansing that needs to take place from the first day of the first month, which lines up with 2014. What is our work as priests as we know that the temple of God is our bodies, that we need to cleanse ourselves from. What is it that we need to cleanse ourselves from up until the porch? Now, the quotation that is found in Signs of the Times, April 22, 1880, paragraph 14, it reads, the command given to Moses to sanctify the people. Were the priests supposed to sanctify the house of the Lord? Yes, right? The command given to Moses to sanctify the people brought great responsibility upon him. He was to faithfully point out their past errors that they might, by humiliation, fasting, and prayer, purify their hearts from the defilement of sin. So it says that as the people were told to cleanse themselves, they were supposed to cleanse themselves from what? from past errors, right? You come to 2014, there are things that we have been learning, which was a misunderstanding of the truths that the Lord was giving us. So here, the work of cleansing, it's part of removing erroneous views that we have been having prior to 2014. And it says that by humiliation, fasting and prayer, purify their hearts from the defilement of sin, so error is sin, as well as cleanse themselves from all outward impurities. So something that is outward is something that you know. Can you see something that is outward? So it's a known thing, right? It's a known sin that we are supposed to be cleansing ourselves since from 2014. When the children of Israel were doing all they could to remove from them all defilement of the flesh, and spirit, they were doing the same work that God requires us to do if we will be brought into close communion with him. However severe and close the battle to overcome wrong habits and sinful indulgences, it must be fought and the victory gained. So here we are told that we need to be overcoming each and every known sin. It says, and the sinful, okay, after the power of the will is brought into activity, then there must be a firm reliance upon Christ. When Israel tested in the wilderness and yielded to sinful murmurings, Christ was to them what he is to us, a compassionate mediator, and he pardoned their transgressions. After man has done what he can to cleanse the soul temple, then Christ's blood alone will avail for us as Christ typified blood 
as Christ typified the blood availed for ancient Israel. So the command to cleanse the, the soul temple, it's for us to overcome each and every known sin. And that's why it has to be ongoing because we are past 2014. And this is what the Lord is requiring from the priest, is that each and every wrong habits that we have, you know, indulged in or inherited, the Lord wants us to overcome. And she says that a victory is possible for us to what? To gain. Now, we know that they were cleansing the temple for eight days. And on the eighth day, they arrived way on the porch. So what does the porch represent? When you go to First Kings, First Kings chapter 7, First Kings chapter 7, verse 7, it says, Then he made a porch for the throne where he might judge even the porch of judgment, and it was covered with cedar from one side of the floor to the other. So according to this verse, it says that the porch symbolizes what? It's a porch of what? Of judgment, right? And where do we mark judgment? It's under which step? The third step, right? So you see that, and they arrived, the priestess, they were cleansing the temple, they arrived on the porch on which day? On the eighth day, right? So where we are marking the porch, we know that it is the eighth. Let me just write day here. It's the eighth day, right? And according to First Kings chapter 7, verse 7, the porch represents what? Judgment. So, I will write here. Is there a judgment at midnight? Is there a judgment at midnight? Yes. So, we are seeing that the number eight then can be put here as a what? As a symbol. Are, are you following? So one of the things that you will be looking at now is we, we have been able to, you know, lay out the foundation, show the pattern why we mark number eight here. We are going to be looking now in the Bible what does the number eight represent and see what it's teaching us when you come to the binding of period. Another quotation just to give a second witness of the porch representing judgment, it says, such thoughts as these were crowding through Isaiah's mind as he stood under the portico of the temple, which is the porch. Suddenly, the gate and the inner veil of the temple seemed to be uplifted or withdrawn, and he was permitted to gaze within upon the Holy of Holies. What is the Holy of Holies? Which place is it? It's the most holy place, right? It's the third step. It's the judgment. Where even the prophet's feet might not enter, there rose up before him a vision of Jehovah sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, while the train of his glory filled the temple. On each side of the throne hovered the seraphim. Their faces veiled in adoration as they ministered before their maker and united in the solemn invocation, Holy, holy, holy. So it's in the most holy place, and you are having how many holies? Three of them, right? Do you have one, two, three here? So you see that where Ezekiel is standing at the portico, which is the porch, he's at the most holy place, which is represented by the number eight, the binding of. Are you following? Okay. So let us look at, trace this number eight. What is it representing in the Bible? Now we go to the book of Acts chapter seven, <coughs> verse eight. <coughs> 
So based upon the representation of the number eight that we find in Second Chronicles, it's teaching us the judgment. It's another witness to show why the judgment of the living is taking place here and not before. Because they are cleansing the temple for eight days and on the eighth day where they end, it's the judgment. So Acts chapter seven, verse eight, it reads as follows. And he gave him the covenant of what? Of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac and what? And circumcised him the eighth day. So the number eight is a representation of what? According to this verse. Circumcision, circumcision right? And one of the things that we are seeing is that circumcision was a what? Was a covenant. Correct? Are we seeing God's people entering into a covenant during this time period? Yes. So you see that the number eight, through the symbol of you know, the covenant of circumcision, you can be able to place it at the binding of period. So what we want to understand is what does circumcision represent? Let's go to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verse 11. Are we there? It says, And he received the sign of what? Of circumcision. Is there a sign at midnight? Yes. So circumcision is a sign, right? And then it continues to say, and he received the sign of circumcision, a what? A seal of what? Of righteousness. Which angel does the work of sealing? It's the third angel, right? Correct? So we are seeing that circumcision is a seal, right? It's a seal of what? Of righteousness. Uh, are you following? So the seal of righteousness, it's brought by the third angel's what? Message. So you see that circumcision, which is a sign, it's the seal of what? Of righteousness. And there's a quotation where I want to show that the sealing angel is indeed the third angel. It says, I then saw the third angel, said my accompanying angel, fearful is his work, awful is his mission. He is the angel that is to select the wheat from the tears and seal what? Or bind the wheat for the heavenly Ghana. These things should engross the whole mind, the whole what? Attention. So we are seeing that the number eight, through circumcision, it's showing us where we are going to be sealed as God's people. And it's during this time period. Now when you go to Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, as we are looking at the symbols of the number 8. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. <clears throat> are we there? The Bible says, In whom also he are circumcised, with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So circumcision is putting away the body of what? Of sin, right? Verse 12. Buried with him in what? In baptism, wherein also he are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who had raised him from the dead. So, baptism is a symbol of what? Of circumcision, correct? So, one of the things that we know, as we know that baptism is a symbol of circumcision, baptism typifies the death and the resurrection of who? Of Christ, right? Is they at that mark at point A? Do we mark that there? So we see that here, there is death. 
But does baptism only represent death? It's death and what? And resurrection, right? And when are we resurrected? It's point. Let me see. So we see that here there is death and there is also what? Resurrection, right? So this is the true baptism that you and I are going to have to experience if we want to receive the seal, which is also represented by the number what? Number eight. So we go to Romans chapter six. Romans chapter 6, verse number 1. It says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to what? To sin live any longer therein. So one of the things that I want us to see is this. With the, with the number 8, it's teaching us the perfect experience of baptism. Once you are baptized, it means you are dead, right? You, you die with Christ. But what are you dying from? You are dying from sin, right? So you see that when you come here, there is death. And this death is symbolizes us dying from what? From our sinful nature, completely or perfectly experiencing the experience of baptism. It says, know ye not that so many of us as we were baptized into Jesus Christ, we were baptized into his what? Into his death, right? Do we mark the cross here? So we see that this is the experience that we need to go through. This is the cross. So with this death, what brings the death? It's the Mara vision. When you go to Revelation chapter 1, because one of the things that we are seeing that there is death, right? The number eight is symbolizing to us that there is death at midnight. But what brings this death is what I want us to see. So when you go to Revelation chapter 1, verse number 13, it reads as follows. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, Clothed with a garment down to the foot, and get about the pubs with a golden candle. So John is seeing who? Who is the one who looks like the Son of Man? It's Christ, right? So verse number 14. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they bend in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, so John is seeing Christ, he's seeing Christ has appeared to John. He says, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as one what? Dead, right? So we see that what produces this death? It's the Marie vision. Are you following? And then it goes on and says, and he laid his right hand upon me saying unto me, fear not. Did Patrick teach us that fear not? We mark it here. 
Yes, right? Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be here after. So you see that after John has received this experience, right? After he was laid down to the, to the ground, his comeliness, his corruption, his comeliness turned into corruption. One of the things that we are seeing is that after he gets strengthened by Christ, he's given what? A message. Because God is telling him to write the things that he's seeing, the things that will be, and the things that will what? Will come. And we know that if he's touched, the Bible just says that Christ laid his hand upon John, right? He's touching him. So we know that Daniel and Revelation, it's one book. So the experience that Daniel went through, it's the very same experience that John went through. So how many times was John touched? It's three times, right? So we see that after three times, he's entrusted with what? With a message. This is the resurrection that we are talking about, which is represented by the number eight. You first die, it's through the Marais vision, and through the experience that you are going through, through the, uh, these three touches, after the third touch, God is able to entrust you with the message and you are able to proclaim it. Now, going to the book of Daniel, because I just said that Daniel and Revelation it's one book. So we are going to Daniel chapter 10. Let's begin from verse 4. Daniel chapter 10, verse 4. The Bible says, And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the river, which is Hedekal, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were gindered with fine gold of Uphers. His body also was like the beryl, and his face as the appearance of lightning. So Daniel is being confronted by Christ, right? The same experience that John had when he saw Christ. Now, verse number seven, there's something that I want us to pick up from there. Daniel says, and I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great what? Quaking. Is a quaking a shaking? Is it a shaking, right? It's the earthquake. So one of the things that I want us to see is that this death here, when there is death, there is an earthquake. Remember when Christ died, was there an earthquake? When he resurrected, was there an earthquake? So we see that the number eight is also bringing us or giving us an understanding, not only of the Marais vision, but what we need to expect, it's an earthquake. So I want us to see what this earthquake represents. When you go into your notes, Prophets and Kings, page 278, paragraph 1. It says, God's message for the inhabitants of the earth is, Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. The conditions in the great cities proclaim in thunder, tones that the hour of God's judgment is come, and that the end of all things, of all things earthly is at hand. In quick succession, the judgments of God will follow one another. And then she says, fire and flood and earthquake with the war and bloodshed. The angel of mercy cannot much longer shelter the impenitent. The storm is gathering and those only will stand who respond to the invitation of mercy. 
as did the inhabitants of Nineveh under the preaching of Jonah, and becoming sanctified through obedience to the laws of the divine ruler. So one of the things that she's doing, she's connecting the earthquake with the judgments of who? Of God. So here we need to expect the judgments falling upon what? The cities. Because she's saying fire and flood and earthquake are the judgments of what? Of God. So an earthquake is a symbol of a judgment. But we also know that when there is an earthquake, there is a shaking, right? So when you go to the next quotation, Christian Experience, page uh, 111, paragraph 1, it reads, December 16, 1848, the Lord gave me a view of the shaking of the powers of the heavens. I saw that when the Lord said heaven, in giving the signs recorded by Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he meant heaven. And when he said earth, he meant earth. The powers of heaven are the sun, moon, and stars. They rule in the heavens. The powers of the earth are those that rule on the earth. The powers of heaven will be shaken at the voice of God. The sun, moon, and stars will be moved out of their places. They will not pass away, but to be shaken by the voice of God. Next quotation. And then she goes on and says, Dark heavy clouds came up and clashed against each other. The atmosphere parted and rolled back. Then we could look up through the open space in Orion. Whence came the voice of God. The holy city will come down through that open space. I saw that the powers of the earth are now being shaken, and that events come in order, war and wars and rumors of war, sword, fame, and pestilence, and, and pestilence are first to shake the powers of the earth. Then the voice of God will shake the sun, moon, and stars, and this earth also. I saw that the shaking of the powers in Europe is not as some teach the shaking of the powers of heaven, but it is the shaking of the angry nations. So one of the things that I want us to see is that when you come here, the earth is to be shaken. So there's a shaking of the earth. When he shall come to the earth again, he will shake not the earth only, but also the heaven. So you see this earthquake is also a symbol of the shakings of the heaven and the earth. But the first thing that the Lord will shake, it's the earth. And after shaking the earth, he also will shake what? The heavens. And Patrick showed us that you come to point B here. This is where the heaven... The earth are to be shaken. Are you following? So let's go to Second Peter, chapter one, verse five to eight. So we are seeing that the symbols of the number eight, they are at the moment perfectly fitting at midnight. So when you go to First Peter chapter one, Second Peter chapter one, from verse five up until eight, the Bible reads, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, right? So you have faith already as your foundation. So you are supposed to add what? Virtue, right? Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, 
and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. So how many rounds does Peter's letter have? It has eight rounds, right? And the eighth one is what? It's charity. Uh, are you following? So let us go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and see how the number 8 connects us with the number 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse number 9 up until number 12. The Bible reads, for we, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a what? As a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish what? Things. So Paul is saying that when he was a, a child, he was seeing things what? Partly, right? He was not seeing them perfectly. He was seeing things in part. But when he becomes a man, he starts seeing what? Things perfectly. Are, are you following? So when you go to... So one of the things that we need to understand or how can I put that one of the things that we need to establish is when does a person become a man because once you become a man it means that everything that is perfect comes what is come right because he says that but when that which is perfect is come then then that which is in part shall be what done away with right so one of the things that we are seeing is this if this is the effect of every vision, does that mean everything gets perfectly fulfilled there? Does everything get perfectly fulfilled at midnight? So it means that before midnight, things are partly what? Fulfilled. Are you following? So when you go to Desire of Ages, page 75, paragraph 1, wanting to establish when does a person become a man, the Bible says, among the Jews, the 12th year was the dividing line between childhood and youth. So you become a man at the age of what? Of 12, right? So we see then through that that this is also represented by the number 12. Are you following so far? So the number eight, it's connecting us with the number 12 through what? Charity. And Brother Patrick also showed us that when we are looking at the number 12, who was called at the age of 12? It was Samuel, right? No, not Jeremiah. Yes, it was Samuel, right? He was called at the age of what? Of 12, and he became a judge, a priest, and a what? And a prophet. So you go to Luke chapter 2, verse 41 to 49, wanting to look at what does the number 12 symbolize. Because we are seeing the number 8, everything that the number 8 is symbolizing, you can see that it's possible to fit it at midnight. So we are going to look chapter 2, verse 41 to 49. Luke chapter 2, verse 49, verse 41 to 49. The Bible says, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, remember we saw that 
the child becomes a youth or a man at the age of what? Of 12. So we can take this story and put it here. So it says that it was during the time of which festive? Which feast, sorry? The Passover, right? Do we mark the Passover here? Yes, you see? So it goes on and says, And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had, had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus did what? Tarried. So at the age of 12, we are seeing that he's tearing. Do we mark a tearing time there? So you see that the parable of the ten virgins gets perfectly repeated or fulfilled where? At midnight. So the number 12 is giving us a symbol of what? Of tearing. So we go to First Kings chapter 18. First Kings chapter 18. Verse 26 to 39. First Kings chapter 18, verse 26 to 39. The Bible reads, And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning even, until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they lived upon the altar which was made. So one of the things that we, we, we know with this story is that there are two prophets, right? There is God's prophet, and there is the prophets of Baal. So whatever they will be doing here, if... If the God that will answer the prayer by sending fire, that person will be proven to be the true what? Prophet. So there are two messages when you come to midnight. And one of the things that you will be seeing is that this number 12, it's truly teaching us that you come here, there are people that will be fully under the control of Satan. And others will be proven to be the servants of who? Of God. So it continues to say, And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is taking, he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey. Or, pre or pre-adventure he sleepeth and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lessons, till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past. So we know that midday is a symbol of what? Of midnight, right? Was past and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was neither voice nor any to answer, nor any they regarded. And Elisha said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elisha took twelve stones. So we see that the number twelve, the story, is taking place or getting fulfilled at midnight. Twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as will contain two measures of seed. So he's repairing, right, the breach that was broken. And we know that you come here, are we supposed to be repairing the breach at midnight? Yes, what will be broken? It's the law of God, right? And then it goes on and says, and he put the wood in order and cut bullocks in pieces and laid him on the wood and filled four barrels with water and poured it on the bent sacrifice and on the wood 
And he said, do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, do it the what? The third time. So we know that it's four barrels of water and they are pouring it how many times? Three times. So three times four is what? It's 12. Another illustration that the number 12 or this event, it's gonna perfectly be fulfilled at midnight. And the water ran round about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the evening, at the time of the offering of the evening, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that these people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood and the stones and the dust, and licked up with the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, he is God, the Lord is God. He is God. So one of the things that we are seeing is that the people that were deceived by these prophets, you come to midnight, they will no more be what? Be deceived because they will be able now to see who is on the Lord's side. So when you go to Revelation chapter 12, the number 12 is also a symbol of the church triumphant. So as we are looking at the number 12, we are in Revelation chapter 12. So we know that we can take this chapter and fit it here. The Bible says, And they appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman, what does a woman symbolize? A church, right? A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of what? of 12 stars. This woman is a church and she's clothed with what? With the sun, right? Who's the sun? It's Christ, right? So you are seeing that it's a perfect church, correct? Because if she's clothed with Christ, it means that she's without what? Sin. Are you following? So you come here at point B, that's where we know that this is the church, what? Triumphant, And this is also illustrated in the book of Matthew. When you go to Matthew chapter 9. So she's having 12 stars. And she's clothed with Christ. So when you go to Matthew chapter 9. Verse 20. Matthew chapter 9, verse 20, the Bible reads, And behold, the woman which was diseased. Now, what is the cause of sin, of, of sickness? Yes, what is the cause of sickness? It's sin, right? So this woman was afflicted because of what? Of sin. with an issue of blood for how many years? 12 years, right? And behold, the woman which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For, he say, for she said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be what? Whole. So, what does the garment represent? It's the character, right? Or Christ's righteousness, right? So she's saying that if she can touch this garment, she'll be what? She'll be whole. She'll be perfectly healed. So one of the things that we know is that can you be whole without the dead angel's message? You can't, right? So when the dead angel's message comes, that's where you are what? Perfectly what? Whole. So we see that this woman gets perfectly healed at the 12th year. So that is why we are marking the number 12 year, which is a symbol of the church, what? 
triumphant. So when you go to Revelation chapter 12, going back to Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12, verse number 12. So it's Revelation chapter 12. We know that we can take the chapter 12 and put it here. But now we will see that we can take verse 12 and perfectly apply it here as a symbol for midnight. Because of the number 12. It says, Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and he that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is what? Is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he had but a what? A short time. Is Satan coming down here? Is he coming down? When he comes down, where do we mark the short time? Or the short period of time or an hour? Where do we mark it? It's A to B, right? So you see that this verse, it's perfectly illustrating events that will be perfectly fulfilled way at midnight. So when Satan comes down, what is that symbolizing? What are the events can we be expecting from that? When you read uh, Evangelism, page 360, paragraph 1, I don't think it's there in your notes. It says, it is when Satan appears as an angel of light that he takes souls in his snare, deceiving them. So when, when Satan comes down, what is he going to do? Deceive. He is going to deceive, right? So how does Satan do that? When you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 13. Remember, when Satan comes down, he's coming to deceive, right? But as he's deceiving, or when he comes down, he comes as an angel of what? Of light. So who are being represented as Satan when he comes down? The Bible says... For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Verse 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of what? Of light. Verse 15. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. So one of the things that you are seeing is that when angel comes down as an angel of light, we say Satan represents what? He's the dragon, right? But the dragon power, is it a religious entity or a state entity? It, it's a state, right? So when he comes down to deceive, He's not using the state, but he's using what? The religious entity. So one of the things that we know is that during this time period, God is dealing with which group of people? The priest, right? Because specifically here, it's the, it's the priest who will be on their death step. So when Satan comes down, he's not going to be using people that are not in this message. But he's going to be using people that are what? Are in this message. Because one of the things that we know is that you come to midnight, the angel of Revelation 18, what? Comes down, right? When it comes down, it comes down with what? With the message. When you reject that message, what happens to you? Can you have another opportunity of receiving the message? You don't, right? What happens to you? You get fully possessed by who? By, sat by Satan. Because here, the only thing that will keep us from not being under the spell of Satan is when we accept the message. But if we do not accept the message, we get 
we get under the control of Satan. And one of the things that I want us to see is this, is that the people here who will be represented as Satan are people that have been, you know, not following the truth that the Lord has been opening up. Because when you come here, when they reject the third angel's message, they start doing what? Deceiving. And who are they deceiving? Are they deceiving the Levites? No. But they are deceiving who? The priest, right? So this is where you see now that the parable of the ten virgins gets perfectly fulfilled way here. Because the parable of the ten virgins, in reality, when it gets fulfilled here, it's not applying to the whole group of the priests, but it's only applying to this little praying company that has been seeing this light. Because under it, that's where you will find the wise and the foolish. Because the people that will be deceived are the people that have not been gathering the oil that we are supposed to be gathering during this time period. When this crisis hit, when this Satan comes down as the angel of light, if we are not grounded on the present truth, on these lines, on these symbols, it's us who are going to be what? To be deceived. So one of the things that we are seeing with the number 12, it's showing us that there is going to be a deception that is going to take place here. And this deception comes because people that are not willing to accept this truth are going to give, the Bible says that uh, in the last days people will be, okay, maybe let's read it. First Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 1 it says, Now the Spirit, the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of what? Of devils. So one of the things that you need to know is that the doctrine of devil, there must be someone that is teaching that doctrine, right? And the people that will be departing from the faith, it's not the people that have already departed in the faith prior to midnight, but it's people that will be in the faith Come midnight, they will what? Depart from it because of this omega that will be taking place. It's going to be deceiving what? People. Because we are told that the omega movement, it's going to go into the cities and do a great and wonderful what? Work. It's not going to deceive people that have not been in this message because the third test is for us who are what? Who are the priests. Continues to say, on manuscript uh, release 11, 1906, these false prophets will have to be met. They will make an effort to deceive many by leading them to accept false theories. Many scriptures will be misapplied. Are we seeing that being done in measure during this time period that we are in? People misapplying the scripture in this movement? Yes, we are. So you come here, remember Paul did say, said what? He was prophesying in part, right? But when he's a man, everything gets what? Perfectly what? Fulfilled. So one of the things that you see is that as they are misapplying the scriptures here, they are still doing that in part. But you come to midnight, they will be doing that perfectly. And many people will be what? Will be deceived. It continues to say, in such a way that deceptive theories will apparently be based upon the words that God has spoken. Precious truth will be appropriated to substantiate and establish error. These false prophets who claim to be taught of God will take beautiful scriptures that have been given to adorn the truth and will use them as a robe of righteousness to cover false and dangerous theories. What are they going to do? They're going to use the false doctrines as the robe of what? Of righteousness. They will be saying that they are what? They are righteous. That is why they will go into the cities and do a wonderful what? Work. Because they will think that God is on their what? On their side. Continuing to say, and even some of those who in times past the Lord has honored, so when you come to midnight, in times past, it means from 1989 up until midnight, the Lord has been honoring people, correct? And it's people that are in 
this movement, the priest. It says, in times past the law, okay, and even some of those who in times past the Lord is honored will depart from depart so far from the truth as to advocate misleading theories regarding many phases of truth, including the sanctuary question. So one of the things that I want us to see or realize is that as this number 12, it's teaching us that here there will be two groups. One group will be fully possessed by the spirit of Satan, while this little praying company inside it, you will have the wheat and the tears, but then they will be revealed because many of us here, if we are not grounded into the present truth, it says we will depart from what? From the faith. Yes. Yes, it was manuscript release, page 11. Uh, manuscript release, volume 11, 1906. Yes. Yes. Okay, I'm reading another quotation from Great Controversy, page 589, paragraph 1. It's also not in your notes. It reads as follows. Through spiritualism, Satan appears as a benefactor of the race, healing the diseases of the people and professing to present a new and more exalted system of religious faith. But at the same time, he works as a destroyer. So one of the things that I want us to see, as they go into the cities and do a wonderful work, they will be counterfeiting the work of true medical missionary work. Because one of the things that we know, can you preach the third angel's message without the health message? Because we are told that the health message is what? Is the right arm of the dead angel. So here we know that we go forth with power to preach the dead angel's message. It means also the health message is going to go here with what? With power. But also these people that are part of the Omega movement, when you come to midnight, they go out also with power, having a what? A counterfeit health message because it clearly says that they will be healing the diseases of the people. So how are they going to be healing the people? It's through this false message. It's through this false health message that they will be carrying and sending it out there. And it's only through God, it's only through a correct understanding of present truth that we can find ourselves not being what? Deceived. So with the... Yeah, MS-11. Yes, MS-11. <clears throat> okay. Uh, second last quote, and then we, we close. In Great Controversy, page 624, paragraph 2. <clears throat> it says, as the crowning act in the great drama of deception... Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of our hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, the Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air. Christ has come. Christ has come. Where do you think the people of the Omega movement think that Christ is coming? It's point A, right? This is where they are saying Christ is what? Has come. Christ has come. And notice what, what will happen. The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him. While he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them, as Christ blessed his disciples, when he was upon the earth, his voice is soft and subdued. Yet full of melody, in gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the, 
of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Savior uttered heals the diseases of the people. So once they, when Satan appears or impersonate Christ, that's where we need to expect the what? The healing. So when Satan comes down, he's impersonating Christ here. He gives this false prophet's power to go around making miracles, deceiving people, so that people can what? Can worship him. But we know that that is why Christ gives a warning. Take heed that no man what? Deceives you. This is what will happen at midnight because many of us who might be studying these things, if these things are not imbued or getting imprinted within our hearts, when midnight comes, we are all going to be what? Deceived. So God is trying to show us that you come to midnight, we really need to come prepared. That is why when you look at the illustrations of what has been shared, is that the Lord wants to give us the latter rain, but he says that I have given you what? The former rain what? Moderately. So these truths that he's giving us, the Lord is desiring us to get them, to eat them so that we can be grounded on what? On the truth. Because you come to midnight, we are seeing that no pain or mind can picture what will be taking place. It's only through a correct understanding of present truth that we can be saved or we can be protected from the deceptions that will be coming at midnight. So with that being said, shall we close with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Our loving Father which art in heaven, Lord, we thank you that you are able to be with us throughout the study. As you are showing us, Lord, the importance of these symbols and what events they are really relating. Lord, I ask that you will help us to take heed at this message, to understand it, Lord, and never take things for granted. I pray that for each and every one of us here, we will be truly grounded into this present truth. As you have given us the time of peace to study your way, to get to know you, Lord, to know your principles, so that we are not taken by this omega when it comes at midnight. I ask that you will truly give us enlightenment, you will truly show us the importance of these things, that our salvation depends on correctly understanding your truth. So grant us your presence, and as we will be Departing now, going for lunch, I pray that you will bless the food and that you will give us the strength to come back as we are planning to have another study after lunch. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen.